As you're all aware, the uh, National Weather Service issued their first probabilistic uh, forecast last week. So we uh, wanted to take an opportunity to, tonight to briefly provide an update on activities that we've been doing and will continue doing. Just a quick note that this does uh, tie into the city's strategic plan uh, regarding the community and safety and well-being initiative. The city's uh, flood event mission includes a number of incident objectives and tools. I won't go through all of those in great detail. Just to note under the uh, objectives, uh, the primary objective is obviously to pr protect the uh, general health, safety, and welfare of the community and to protect public infrastructure and services. And that's really borne out um, in the kinds of aid that are available if there's a federal disaster or state disaster declaration. Protection of public infrastructure and services are eligible for assistance in those kinds of events. In terms of the tools that we use, obviously we use the policy and direction uh, that are set by the city council, the permanent flood mitigation improvements that we've completed, and where necessary, and hopefully to a very limited degree, uh, temporary emergency measures, things like sandbags, temporary clay levees, and so on. <clears throat> this next slide uh, actually comes from the National Weather Service. They had a briefing uh, last Friday. I thought this was a good slide that summarizes uh, the current forecast, so I borrowed it from them. Um, and you've seen this before, the, the seven factors that weigh into a spring, spring flood potential. Uh, the first two, fall moisture and uh, base stream flow. Uh, obviously, it was a very, very wet fall. Um, the river flows, if you, if you watch that at all, have been very high throughout the, the fall and the winter, uh, actually in the 90 90th percentile um, range, so that's very high for those times of year. Three, four, and five, we're kind of uh, into those uh, factors now. Frost depth, interestingly enough, the frost is really not all that deep. But again, the soils are saturated from the fall moisture, so whether or not frost depth is a big factor uh, remains to be seen. Winter snowpack, we're all obviously aware of the status of winter snowpack. I think we're at 40, 41 inches compared to the typical is about 30 <coughs> inches, so we're ahead of, we're ahead of normal there. Uh, factor number five, snow water equivalent. You'll note at the bottom of the slide snow water equivalent is high, near typical winter season values already. So those first five factors really are the ones that set the stage for the potential of a spring flood. And if you look back historically, whether or not we have a flood and the magnitude of that flood is really determined by those factors that we won't know for a while, number six and number seven. What is the thaw like and what kind of precipitation might we or might we not have? So the first forecasts issued by the National Weather Service are probabilistic forecasts. Uh, and you've seen this graph before, but I think it's worth making the distinction, the distinction between the kinds of forecasts that are issued. Uh, these start in late January, go through early to mid-March. Uh, they're presented in this format along the bottom. Difficult to read here, but percent chance exceeding. And then up on the uh, vertical axis is river stage. To develop these uh, forecasts, the uh, National Weather Service uses existing conditions and then uses historical weather data from now through the spring melt. And so each year represents a data point. They run that through their model and that produces a river stage for, that, for each of those given conditions. And so that tells us various probabilities. The, uh, the black line, which in this case is the, the upper line, represents the uh, conditional simulation, which is current conditions. 
projected forward. The blue line is historical. The, the point being, if the black line is significantly above the blue line, there's a, a, a major potential for a spring flood, which is the case now. So pulling some numbers from that graph, these are uh, select numbers for different percent chance exceeding. So along the bottom, you'll see that 90% chance exceeding, 75% chance exceeding, and so on. On the, the vertical axis is river stage. So for example, the 50th percentile um, percent chance exceeding, I should say, is currently 35.9 or roughly 36 feet. To put that in the context of the city's permanent protection, <coughs> the, uh, the top of the permanent improvements are levees are at a river stage of 44 feet. That's the top of that gray shared, shaded area in that graph. Ideally, we would like to have at least three feet of what's called freeboard. So the distance from the top of the levee to the actual water surface at the crest, that three feet then 44 minus three is 41. That's the bottom of that gray shaded area. So the, the freeboard is really, again, uncertainty, or you might consider it sort of an insurance zone, right? So we'd prefer to have three feet. Obviously, we'll take whatever we can get. Uh, so relative to those permanent improvements, uh, you can see the various forecast numbers, the 5% the, uh, chance exceeding, still falling below 41 feet all very manageable numbers where we have permanent infrastructure installed. I would also note along the bottom, there's some additional dates that um, are not shown as bars. Those are the dates projected for future forecasts. And so what we will do when those forecasts are issued is we'll add bars to this graph for those forecasts so we can see how the, uh, those forecasts progress throughout the next couple of months. The other kind of forecast um, that the Weather Service issues is called the deterministic forecast. This is one, once we're well into the melt period, water is now flowing in the river, and you'll see a forecast graph that looks something like this. You probably recall these from last year. Uh, the, uh, the blue on that line <clears throat> in the graph representing actual river stages and the uh, purple or red representing projected. So we get hourly, or every six hour projections for river stage, uh, again, during an active event. And the reason that I wanted to make sure we distinguished here is because the city's emergency measures policy hinges off of this type of forecast, deterministic forecast as opposed to probabilistic. So that emergency measures policy is set forth in resolution. The next two slides are just excerpts of the text from that emergency measures policy, which was originally adopted in 2013. Uh, and the city council reaffirmed this policy in March of last year for the 2019 flood event. So this sets forth the uh, policy for deployment of emergency measures. You'll note the city will deploy emergency measures to reduce the risk of flood damage to private property and public infrastructure off of the riverfront. That may result in riverfront properties being located on the riverward side of those emergency measures. Goes on further, the city will consider purchasing and delivering empty sandbags and loose sand to riverfront neighborhoods and or properties when a National Weather Service deterministic forecast has been issued that predicts a crest of 42.5 feet or greater. And then lastly, uh, in that bottom bullet point, uh, which is really intended to address coordination of protection that the city will put in place for public infrastructure versus private property protection, uh, indicating that we would, to the best of our ability,
coordinate those two separate efforts, uh, but protection of public infrastructure and private property off of the riverfront would take precedence. <coughs> So at the conclusion of tonight's discussion, the, this emergency measures policy, uh, which is included in your agenda packet, um, is up for city council action when staff is requesting that the city council reaffirm that policy for this coming year. This policy is really the critical foundation for all of our planning efforts. If we change this policy, our planning efforts are dramatically different. A little note on uh, what's been accomplished since the 2009 uh, flood. And we're showing some emergency measures information here for two different river stages. Those are kind of key river stages uh, for us and that's why we're using those. <clears throat> uh, 38 feet basically because below 38 feet there's very minimal <clears throat> excuse me uh, emergency measures needed uh, under current conditions and then 41 feet which is uh, essentially the 2009 flood of record uh, you'll note for each of those we're showing conditions as they were pre-2009 flood event compared to current conditions uh, the pre it's important to note the pre-2009 numbers do not include the Oakport annexation area. If they did, those numbers would be even larger than what's shown. Uh, and the current numbers assume that we will be following the emergency measures policy. So for example, in terms of sandbags, and we'll just use the 41-foot uh, the uh, river stage as an example, uh, pre-2009 conditions would have required about 2.8 or 2.9 million sandbags. And under today's conditions, about 54,000. In terms of temporary levy, clay levees, uh, about 10.5 miles. Under today's condition, about 1.76. Uh, along the bottom, in the bottom table, I should say, are some historical uh, flood crests uh, last year. Uh, making number 10 on the list. And it's important, I think, to note that the top six are within the last 20 years, the top eight within the last 30 years. We've made quite a bit of progress, even since uh, the flood event last year. Most of that progress is in terms of property acquisition. Uh, and most of that is associated with the uh, North Moorhead project. Uh, this is taken directly, uh, these numbers are taken directly from the city's flood mitigation plan that was adopted in August of 2018. Mm -hmm. Identifies the number of properties that are eligible for voluntary acquisition. You'll see the total is 92. Uh, since last spring, we have acquired 26. 24 of those located in that North Moorhead project area. 50 of those properties are um, property owners where we have in the past provided voluntary acquis acquisition offers at least once, but those were declined. Uh, the remaining 16 have never had an acquisition offer. They are currently in process. We're doing appraisals for those properties or for those owners that were interested in an appraisal uh, with the idea of securing option agreements. There's currently no funding to acquire those properties. The idea being if we get option agreements in place, if the legislature pr uh, provides additional flood mitigation funding this coming session, uh, an option agreement puts us in a very good position to uh, expend funds and deliver those acquisitions. So that's pretty significant progress uh, since the, uh, the last flood. This is the, that North Moorhead area, uh, that North Moorhead project where we're going to be constructing a levee. All of those properties shown in green are the ones that were acquired in total or in part. Some of those were not, uh, we, we acquired only what we needed for the project. The big differences are our sandbag and clay levee numbers last year um, were affected by those properties being in private ownership. This year, um, 
the city owns those properties. Our permanent levy has not yet been constructed. It's under, the first phase is under contract for construction this year. However, as we own the properties, we'll be able to install temporary clay levies if needed on those properties. The, the uh, 40th Avenue properties are shown in orange. Those are the properties where we're currently working with owners on appraisals and potential option agreements. So last year, the city council made an exception to the emergency measures policy for property owners that had never received a previous acquisition offer. <coughs> if the city council chooses to do the same this year, that would be the universe of properties where we would make that exception, those that are shown in orange along 40th Avenue North. This table provides a summary of sandbag estimates at different river stages. So the first column indicates a crest for a sandbag levy. Two feet of freeboard is usually what's practical. So that's the second column. That would be the top of the, the sandbag levy. So public infrastructure, you'll see no sandbags are needed until a river stage of 41. Uh, for those 40th Avenue North properties, the first sandbags would be needed for a river stage of 40. The column that's uh, in the dashed box then represents the total that would be the city's goal to protect public infrastructure and those few properties on 40th Avenue North. I would note that Steve has stored about 30,000 sandbags from last year's event. So we are uh, in good shape through about a 40-foot flood without any pre-event sandbag preparation. The private property column gives you the number of sandbags that would be needed for all of those other properties remaining on the riverfront. This is an update for uh, temporary clay levees at various river stages. Um, Nothing below 37 feet, very minimal at 37 feet, uh, and then grows from there. Miles is a little bit disingenuous to this because some of these are very small, very short levees. They're not very high. So for the engineer types, we look at cubic yards and cubic yards. Those numbers are manageable. What we will do as the flood event approaches, we'll look at locations where these things may be needed and would work to uh, secure some quotes from contractors to install those should they be needed. All we would need to do then is pick up the phone and direct the contractor to do that. Our flood plan uh, is extremely detailed and uh, very well laid out. Um, 290 steps, a lot of which go unseen to the public. Um, we implement this during an event uh, daily, looking at what actions need to be taken each day, and, and it's available both in a tabular and mapping format through our GIS system. Last year, we made a pretty significant effort to update our org chart. I realize you can't see that, but we can make that available. The point here is that it's very detailed. This is a cross-departmental effort and really a cross-agency effort. Uh, the county, potentially the National Guard, all sorts of resources from the region and the state depending upon the magnitude of the event. And then it's, and for the public um, on, our, on our website, we do have access to this property mapping tool, so a property adjacent to or on the riverfront. Uh, for those property owners interested in what their critical river stage is, they can zoom into that property and, and look at what elevation is critical for, for their lot, but more importantly for their structure. Uh, they can also use a, our interactive mapping and look at different river stages in half foot increments. So that information is available. We will continue to monitor the weather surface forecasts and provide updates. February 13th is the next, uh, the issuance of the next probabilistic forecast. Uh, we've already been working internally to uh, determine the level of effort that might be needed. We'll be doing some staff training uh, as we get into uh, February. So a number of internal activities, really nothing uh, expended at this point other than staff time directed towards that planning. Uh, 
as I mentioned, the, there's a resolution tonight on the council agenda to confirm city policy. Uh, should you do that, we would follow up in early February with letters to affected property owners. Uh, the, the, obviously, the letter to those 40th Avenue North property owners would be different than the balance of the uh, riverfront properties, just as a reminder of what the policy would be. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bob. Uh, does that present any uh, questions or comments from anyone? Council Member Dahlquist. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick question about, are we um, inspecting like what's already been put up so we keep track if there's any erosion or any possible breakage anywhere? We sure do. We, we um, annually inspect flood infrastructure. In fact, those parts that are FEMA accredited, we are required not, not only that, but to, to document in detail. And over the, over the years, we have observed issues and we correct those annually. And we will, prior to this flood event, exercise gates and pump stations and things like that, so yes. Council Member Watson Curry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm, uh, we'll gladly support this resolution. I think it's important and we're consistent. Um, I did just want to inquire, maybe you, you might not know the answer, but a question about flood insurance came up from a, a resident and I imagine the deadlines will be creeping up pretty soon if they were going to secure a policy. Do you have any resources or recommendations on that? So the resource we'd offer is your insurance agent. <laughs> uh, and the deadline really is, it needs to be in effect 30 days, 30 days. prior to any claim. Okay. So there's still time to do it, mm -hmm. but for those property owners that would like to do it, they should do it now. Yeah. And we always, always recommend that property owners uh, evaluate and obtain flood insurance for most properties that are not in the floodplain, which in Moorhead now is many, many properties. Mm -hmm. um, you get a preferred rate, which is relatively cheap. It's probably in the range of $500 per year. So we always recommend people do that. It was a great question. Thank you. Council Member Lindos. Um, thank you, Mayor Judd. Um, first, I'd like to compliment um, yours and probably also Director Moore's um, efforts on essentially making the city a very prepared and safe place for, for reasonable flood events. Um, it occurred to me also that people, you know, it's hard when you talk about even cubic yards of, of levy. Um, and I don't know if you can do this on the fly, but, you know, um, the amount of miles, I mean, it was very clear it was less. You could also talk about numbers of dump trucks needed. And Roughly divide those by 10. Yeah. And so that's not that many dump trucks that are needed. So um, in terms of, I remember how many dump trucks um, in 2009, and that was a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot. And wear and tear on our roads. Wear and tear, yeah. Which, I, I, I would also, yeah, thank you for that. And I'd also point out, um, in addition to Steve, our core planning team includes Christy Leshevsky, Chad Stangland, our emergency manager, and the, the real uh, brains behind the flood plan, uh, Tom Trowbridge, assistant city engineer. But it is a very <laughs> sta wide, there's a lot of people involved in this effort. Well, they should all be applauded. Thank you. Council Member White. I just wanted mm -hmm. clarification. So if we were, in terms of our action tonight, if we want to make an exception for those um, properties in Oakport, similar to what we did last year, that's something we need to Amen. include in our recommendation, in our action tonight? Last year, I think we used this language and we took your verbal direction as an exception. The reasoning. I, I would support that. That's that reason, any other questions or comments? No. Okay. Uh, Council Member Carlson. I move to approve the resolution to establish city policy for Sandbag and emergency measure deployment during flood events with the exception that, um, similar to what we did in 2019. Second. Yep. Okay. Motion been made by Council Member Carlson, seconded by Council Member White. Do we need any clarification or was it understood what was done last year? 
Okay, great. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman.